Hi, City Life family. It's really good to be here on Sunday morning again for me to give this series on the birth of the church. This, uh, I believe we're around the seventh series right now. And the subject I want to be talking about in this season that we're in is about culture, race, and unity, and predominantly in the church. We know there's a lot of things that are happening at this moment in time in this country and also around the world. Uh, especially with the George Floyd um, issue that uh, happened in May. Um, but I've always wondered why um, in situations like this that um, things rise up that aren't often to do with the Bible and nothing to do with what God says in Scripture. And today I thought I will tackle the Scriptures and we'll see what Jesus said. Now, I've been sent many, many um, um, emails and texts and all sorts of things from all different people, even within my own church. And I thought it would be a good idea to come from the point of what Jesus would do and what Jesus would say, um, instead of using our own opinions and using our own ideas and our ideologies and our history and those kind of things. Because it's such a hot potato, um, not just within the church, but also outside the church. And uh, one of the things that came to mind this week was about the image of God, and God created us in his own image. In other words, he gave life out of, out of the, the, the earth to, to Adam, and he gave life to every single one of us. And, and life is such an important thing. But life is not just an important thing to those that are black, white, or, 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 or Asian. Or it, it is important in, 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 in circumstances such as those that are in the womb. So we have understanding about life that is in the womb. And um, some of us want to kill that life in the womb. God loves life. When God created you and me, he loves the image that he created. It doesn't matter where you've come from, your, your, your ethnic background, he loves the way we are. So we're going to have a, just have a look at this subject and, and we want to explore some of the things. Now, because we're doing the birth of the church, the very important thing about all this is that we've got to realize that even in Jesus' time, there were prejudices, there, were, there was racial tension um, as, as well. And we're going we're gonna to see where, where this aligns up in Scripture. Even, even right in the birth of the church, we're going to be looking at certain parts of the book of Acts where the church starts to expand and extend and where there's confusion because of the thinking of people today. And I pray that uh, as we listen to what Jesus thinks and what Jesus wants and where Jesus is coming from, we'll, we'll understand some of the things that we are going to be moving forward in. Um, this is not about sociology or anthropology, which is the, 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 uh, the, the theory of, of, of human behavior, but it's about theocracy. It's about being theocratic in our understanding about when God made every single one of us in his, in, in his image. And God's view, for me, is the most important view, not just my view. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to uh, John chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at this scripture about the Samaritan woman, which meets the Jesus for the very first time. And uh, let me just read you some of the scriptures, and I'm going to just paraphrase some of these through, and then we're going to extrapolate, ex do an exegesis, like I said, draw some things out of this, some principles that we can understand how Je what Jesus actually went through. I'm just going to start at verse 4. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made baptisms more disciples than John. So it says that Jesus was very well known. So this is, a, this is in the context of what I'm talking about here, is that Jesus is very well known. He does more baptisms at this period of time than John the Baptist ever did. So he's, uh, he's, he's, he's quite famous at this point. And though Jesus himself did not baptize, it says so Jesus never did baptizing, he, 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 he push that responsibility onto his disciples. It says in verses 3, it says, He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, and he needed to go through Samaria, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of, the, of, of ground that Jacob gave uh, to, his, uh, to his son Joseph. 
So here, right at the beginning, we see, see the geographical area. Let me just explain this a little bit. Right on the top was Galilee. Right in the middle was Jacob's well. Right at the bottom was Jerusalem's south. So he had to pass through Jacob's well to get to Galilee. And that area um, was kind of neutral ground. And where the Samaritans and the Jews would meet, Jacob's well was a, a very important part of that, of that plan. Now, when we talk about the... Um, this the the, the 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 kind of the Samaria and the Sam, the, the, the Samaritans and, and th those kind of things, we often don't understand the history about that. In 722, uh, Assyria was allowed to invade Israel because the Israel themselves were needed to be judged, and and so um, God allowed that to happen. And then when they went back to Syria, the, the Syrians, um, they took some of the Jewish people with them and they intermingled. And when they intermingled, they created what we call is the, the Samaritans. And because the Samaritans are seen as half-breeds almost, that's how they saw them um, by the Jews, there was this great big tension and friction, racial tension if you can call it that, even prejudice between the, between the two. So the history behind this is very, very important as we look at how Jesus approaches this, this very event. He goes in to the enemy's territory. Remember what it says in the book of Acts. It said they went from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Why Samaria? Because one of the areas that Jesus wanted us to evangelize is into areas where we ourselves as Christians, and let's, let's look from the Christian perspective, is to go into areas where, where we, we are not the same as other people. And in, in other words, there is, there's a difference between me and, and, and other, other people. So the, 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 main, the main dominant part here is the Christian going in and evangelizing in areas that they would never ever go into. So the first thing that Jesus do in verses 5, so he came to the city of Samaria, it's called Sychar, near the positive ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being tired from, from his journey, was sitting by the well. So he's sitting by the well, and he's thirsty, and this is, the, this is what we, we get here, this is the picture. The Bible says it's the sixth hour, so it's 12 o'clock in the middle of the day, and here comes a woman, a Samaritan woman, comes along and, and Jesus wants water from her. Now, listen to me. Jesus, being a Jew, asks a woman of Samaria to give him water to drink from the same cup. There is something underlining in this message. Now, listen to, listen to me very carefully. A Jew asking a woman... First of all, a woman of all, all, all people, because Jews never asked women for, for anything in those days. But to draw, to drink of the same cup was totally unheard of. Now, we've got to understand again the geographical area. Jacob's well was neutral territory for the Jews and for the Samaritans. Because Jacob, I mean, for the Samaritans, they believed in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. They believed in the um, Pentateuch. They believed in the five books of, of Moses. They believed in that. And in, that, in those books, uh, we have Jacob in those books. And so did the Jews believe it. So Jacob as well was like, like kind of like neutral territory for them. So Jesus being there and a Samaritan being there, that was, that was, that was okay. And, and John brings, in his passage, he brings that out. There are two people who have culturally complete differences between them, and yet they are able to come together um, in, in a neutral territory and they are able to even speak together. And what's even worse is a Jewish man speaking to a Samaritan woman. So you, can, you, can, you, you get the picture here. This is totally unheard of. For Jacob was the father of the Jews and the Samaritans. So for them, it was, this, was, this territory was, was fine territory. It was a place of agreement. In other words, it was a place of understanding. Now, we're talking about the Christian here. This is the place where we have to come to in terms of our cultures and say this is the place, Jacob's well is the place of agreement. 
In churches today, we have to understand something about churches. Churches are meant to have all nations and all tribes coming to, to, to their church, not just one one group of culture, and I can understand that sometimes, or another, or be prejudiced against another. We need to come to a place which is called Jacob's Well, where we meet on neutral territory, where we agree on neutral territory over issues that are likewise. And what are those issues likewise? Well, they are kingdom issues. You see, they are not um, uh, Asian issues, they're not African issues, they're not English issues, they're not European issues, they are kingdom issues. The Bible always supersedes the culture. And if we're going to get on, if, we, if people are going to get on with each other in this world, they have to understand as Christians, it's a, it's a very important issue that we come to a point where we are to agree at Jacob's well. And I think, you know, with our, our church, we're, we're not perfect, but we, we have, you know, over 30 nations in our church. We're a multicultural church, and we are definitely multicultural in our church. We come to this place when we come every Sunday and we come to worship at a place where we can drink out of one cup, and that is the cup that is offered by Christ himself. You see, in verse 9 it says this, it tells us, Therefore, it says, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? So she's saying, you, being a Jew, is asking me, a Samaritan woman, for, for a drink. Since I'm a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So there is, she's saying, hey, listen, we, we, we just do not talk to each other. We don't even speak to each other. We, we don't even relate to each other. You know, we, we have prejudices against each other. They're, we are racially um, uh, against each other. Now, before I go on, I want, you, I want to call your attention to verses 8. It also says, where are the disciples at this time? It says, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy some food. So they've gone off. They've gone off for KFC, whatever you want to call it. They've gone off, and they've gone to have their, their meals. So they're, 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 they're away. So it's only Jesus is at this well. It's only the Samaritan woman at this well. So they're going, going into the city to buy some food and bring it obviously back for Jesus. Now the Samaritan woman looks at Jesus and after Jesus is offering the drink from her cup, she can't figure out um, this guy is being a Jew. She, now the th thing about it, again, if we look at this very carefully and we look at this, the chapter, we see that she didn't have to figure out that Jesus was a Jew. She already knew he was a Jew. A lot of people say to me, well, there's no description of Christ in the scriptures. You are, you're absolutely right. But this tells us that Jesus must have looked like a Jew. So, you know, what Jews look like these days, I mean, they're almost the same color as me, maybe a little bit of olive skin, um, you know, and, and they, they, they kind of, you know, they look Jewish. You know, they, they, there's a distinctive look about Jewish people, like there's a distinctive look about every culture that we know. We can often tell. So this woman doesn't ask if you're a Jew. She just knows that he's a Jew. And so it helps us that he, there's an identity here, and Jesus doesn't object to her calling him a Jew. This is, a, this is the, the, one of the greatest things that we have to identify with ourselves. You see, God doesn't want us to stop identifying ourselves from the culture that we come from. If, if, you know, if you are from India, then praise the Lord, you are an Indian, and that's a great thing. If you are an African, you know, praise the Lord that you're African, that's the culture that you've come from. Or if you're from Asian, China, and, and uh, you know, in Vietnam, it really doesn't matter. The first thing you've got to know is who you are. I can remember in 1968 when I... Um, came to this, well, came to, came to school in this country, and I can remember going to school. And I can remember being uh, physically abused and verbally ab being abused by lots of people because there weren't many Asian-looking kind of guys in England at that time. I would run away from gangs who would try to beat me up, and I was beaten up several times. I was, firework was put into my, uh, into my doors and all sorts of things. But, you know, there was something that sustained me all through that time. It was, the, it was Christ himself. And even though these guys were able to do what they were able to do at that time, and they're not allowed to do what they are, uh, they wouldn't be able to do what they can do then, that they can do now, I understood one thing. I kind of denied who I was. 
because I'm mixed race, you see. I, I, I've got a mum who's partly Portuguese, partly English, dad Persian, Indian background, um, born in India, brought up in France, came here to, to England, you know, really mixed, wife Italian, you know, what, what mixture can, can you get? But as I started to grow up, I started to embrace who I was uh, as a mixed race, and I loved God for that. And I thought to myself, why am I trying to deny who I am? You know those forms that you have to often sign? You have to sign them, and they say, what, where are you from, you know? And I often would say, um, English, British, and that kind of stuff. But now I can say, you know, I'm the other. I am the other, and I'm proud to be the other person. Because God wants us to identify who we are first. So Jesus doesn't deny that he is from a Jewish culture. His father was Jewish, um, Joseph, and it, we know that from the background, going all the way back to the genealogy of Abraham as well. And I find that remarkable. So don't ever take away the identity of who you are. But there's more than that for Christians. In other words, Jesus didn't stop being who he was to reach somebody else. You don't stop being who you are to reach somebody else. You see, I, I've gone around the world because my, my dad was a navigator, my mum was a hair hostess, and I've gone around the world, and wherever we've gone, we've loved the cultures and, and the people that we've met, because we don't stop, because of who, us being a different to, to the, the people that we reach, we don't stop who we are, and, and we never stop who we are. Jesus was there with the woman at the well, She's, he was ready to, 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 to take the water from her cup, because he would, never choose, he would never change his identity, and she didn't have to change her identity either. So the Bible says that, uh, and very clearly, that the culture is something that we have to identify ourselves with. Now, how do we, we, we take this into the, the arena that we're in? When we hear about more about the skin than the sin, the problem is today, we have a very, very powerful enemy. And behind every source, is never, it's never about the skin. It is always about the sin. People are forgetting these days. We have an enemy out there. And the enemy can, uh, can rile us up into hatred, into thinking about our past and thinking about the things that w w what may have happened to us and what did happen to us. And, and we can bring out so many um, things that are derogative towards the skin color, but what is behind that is always going to be the sin. You see, a Christian is a Christian. If Jesus was able to pass the demarcation line and go over to Samaria and be at the well, and, and drink out of a cup from a woman, or equally, not just from a woman, but from a, a, a Samaritan woman, imagine what God is calling us to do. We need to cross those borders. He's not expecting us not to relate to people that are different to us, because otherwise we would never be the Christians that we are meant to be. There is a lot of ignorance in terms of culture around the world, there is a lot of ignorance about people's culture and the way they do things. But you know, I, I, I've, I've loved the variety and the diversity of, of people and how we can embrace that today. God is not asking you to be anything other than what you are. He made you the way you are and, that, and the reason why you are the way you are is because you are made in his image. I love the way I am because God made me in his image. Now, sometimes we do this. We talk about ourselves being a white Christian. Or we talk ourselves of being a brown or a black Christian. But there's no such thing in the Bible. Let me tell you what's in the Bible. Because the, the, the description of, of being white, brown or black is an adjective, you see. Um, the Christian bit is a noun. What we need to do is swap it around. First of all, I am a Christian. That is my ultimate identity. I am a Christian. I am what I am. That's the noun. What comes after the noun is the adjective. Yes, I am a Christian, but I may be a kind of an olive brown kind of skin looking Christian. But that's, that's irrelevant to God. The first thing God wants to know and Christ wants to know is how do I react as a Christian? The problem today, what we do, is, is we do this. We say we're either white or we're brown, 
and we either say we're British or we say we're African, we say we're Indian, and what we do is we try to rearrange our culture to suit the Christianity. And the problem is, is, is this. Then we become individuals and not Christians. We, we come out of the arena of what God wants us to be rather than being what God wants us to develop into. You see, the first aspect of you being what you are is, I am a born-again Christian, I live according to the rules of Christ, I love the people that are around me, because it says, love your neighbor as yourself, that's everybody, pers- every person lo- around me. It says, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, not one nation, not, not brown, black, or white, it says all nations. All of that comes in and comes in me being a Christian first, but I may be an olive kind of brownish Christian as well. But I embrace my identity, but I'm more than that, I embrace who I am as a Christian. And I've always identified that first in my life. So if people ask me, where do you come from? I say, for, well, I'm a, kingdom, I'm a kingdom child. But, you know, in this world, yes, I'm from this country, but... I have come from a culture of, of which, is, which is kingdom culture itself. So embrace that, because otherwise you will identify yourself as somebody else which is not within the circles of what God wants you to be. So the woman is overwhelmed because he's doing something that no Jew does, and he's doing something that no one has done since 722 B.C., He's coming to this woman open-hearted. He's coming to this woman with, 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 a, with a, if you can read it very, very carefully, he's coming to this woman, you know, with, with no aspirations at all. And he's trying to relate to this woman. And he's trying to, to, to understand why this woman is, is the way she is. Now, she becomes a key to the Samaritan evangelistic groups eventually. As we look at this, and this is, like I said, it's nothing to do with sociology here or anthropology, the way I behave. It's to do with theocracy. It's to do with God, um, the study of who God is and how Jesus' perspective on cultures are. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shocker to the woman because he's going to put Jewish lips on Samaritan cup. Jewish lips on a Samaritan cup. What, what, that would be a brilliant sermon. I should have thought that as my sermon title. Jewish lips on a Samaritan cup. And God calls us to put our Jewish lips on, Samaritans, on, on Samaritan cups. So Jesus tells in verses 10 of John chapter 4. He says this. Culturally, he says this. He changes, he changes the atmosphere a little bit. If you knew the gift of God and who it was... Let me just read that out to to, to you in in the verse itself. It says, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who 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 says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So Jesus says this. He says, look, if you really knew who I was, the Son of God. Now, listen to me. The Samaritans are waiting for the Son of God. And he's saying, if you really knew who I was, right, You'll be asking for me, and not just ordinary water, but you'll be asking for living water, because I am the living water. Now, everyone who drinks your water, verses 13, has, has gone thirsty. So he says, everybody that drinks from the well has gone thirsty and gets thirsty. But then he says, let me just read this out to you. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of the water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become, uh, become in him a fountain of water springing him, uh, springing him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So he says this, by me, being the living water, will give you everlasting life. What a wonderful message that he starts to give to this woman. He says, here I am. This is what is going to cross cultural boundaries. This is what's going to cross race boundaries. This is what's going to cross the boundaries of prejudicial issues. He says, 
We are a part of the living water that give us, gives us everlasting life. Jesus said in verses 17, then he says, then let me read, read that, that out to you. He says, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. So now he's, he changes the tone a little bit. And this is, this is what amazes me. First of all, he tells her the, the spiritual and, and, and what, what she needs and, 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 and that he's Jesus Christ and, and that he's the living water and that if, if she knew him, you know, there'd be an everlasting life. Then she then identifies the problem. The problem is not her being a Samaritan. Now, get me here, get me here. It's not the problem of her being a Samaritan. It's not the problem of her being white, brown, black. It's not the problem. That's not the problem. The problem now, he says to her, you know, it talks about her husband. Well, more than husbands, five husbands. This is the key. Now he's getting into her stuff. He's getting into her, her business. Now, this is what happens, you see. It's not, about, it's not about the culture now. It's gone away from the culture. We, we've identified, you're Jewish, I'm Samaritan, that's all very good, we've identified. We are now talking about the sin. We're not talking about the skin. We're talking about the sin that comes across those barriers. You see, you see a sin is a sin. It really doesn't matter. You see, any man kneeling on, a, on, on another man's neck is, is a sin. It's, it's, you know, it doesn't matter what what color skin he is, it's a sin, it's a sin, it's, it's hatred. It's, it doesn't come from the source of heaven. It's not, it's not Christ-like. So we have to remember this. The woman, he says, yes, where's, where's, your, where's your husband? He says, well, yes, um, I don't have a husband. No, because you've had five. So he, he, Jesus then starts to cro cross over and says, yes, okay. Now we've, we've put aside our cultural differences now we're talking about the real issues here. And that is about the sin that we're talking about. Yes, and the man that you're living with now, yeah, we know. Hey, come on. It's, it's you know, you're living with somebody else now. So you've had five husbands. Now, now you're living with somebody. That is the main issue here. So we have, we, 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 we've identified now that it's once we pass that sociology and that anthropology kind of thinking, the, the behavior, we come now to the theology. Let's, let's ask ourselves what we are talking about here. Verses 19 to 20, let me read this out to you. And then it says this, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So she identifies him as, as, as someone who is, is, is a prophet, and someone who's prophesied into her life. So she knows there's something very special like that's come over her right now. And then he says this. Listen to this. Verse 20, this is what she says. This is the crucial turning point here, folks. Our father worshipped on the mountain, and listen to this, a racial, a racial slur here, and you, Jews, very racial, you Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do and not know. We know what we worship for the salvation is of the Jews. Then he goes on to say, For the hour is coming and now is that when, when the true worshipper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now listen, this is, this is the turning point. This is what he's saying. Now, Jesus has been very polite up to this point, but now you're bringing my Father into it. Now you're starting to bring Christianity into this. Don't use your Christianity to publicize who you are. Don't try to cover up everything that you have done in terms of who you are by your Christianity. Don't try to, don't try to do that. This, this is where he's coming from. He's saying, she's saying, look, uh, you, you, you know, we worship over there. And she says, you worship over there, so that's your church, and that's my church. And she said, we've been worshipping there for many, many years, 
And you've been worshipping in Jerusalem for many, many, many years, and, and that's what we are. And, and he says very carefully this. He says, listen, and this is what he's saying. He's saying, you've got to listen that even in your background, your cultural background, where, wherever you've come from, whatever your mum and dad's told you, if, you're not, if they're not Christians, whatever your grandfather's told you, whatever your ancestral people have told you, it's totally irrelevant irre if you don't worship him in spirit and in truth. The key thing here is this. You cannot blame or listen to every person that you are related to because of what that they said or what has happened in the past. When you come to Christ, when you come to a place of, of, of Christianity, a true Christian comes to a place, they must understand that even though your mum and dad may have said something, my dad worshipped fire. Now look at me. Have I ever worshipped fire? No. My mum was a Roman Catholic. Did I ever go and, 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 and do mass or, 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 or do penance um, and go to a priest? No, I never did any of that stuff. But because I knew that there was a tr another truth, and that is to worship Jesus Christ in, in spirit and in truth. Did I follow the culture of fa my father? No. Did I follow the culture of my mum? No, I didn't. I followed Jesus Christ. That is in truth and in spirit. So if I'm going to bring anything that I feel that is right or wrong, I bring it out through what Christ has said, and through what the Word of God says. But if I try to use the Word of God to obtain my bias towards something, by adding Scripture, and people are very, very good at doing this, adding Scripture here and there to what they're saying, and unless I see it in its context, and I say it in its context, and I say, no, I'm going to worship it in spirit and truth. You see, I could look at my background and I could feel very bitter, I could feel very sad, I could feel hatred, but I don't feel like that at all. I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. And I know there's a Christ who loves all cultures, who loves all races. And, and, and as we get move into, into a new arena, I believe if we move into an arena and embrace all cultures, embrace um, all, all, all different differences in people. You know, I, I've always said this, we're unified in our diversity and we are diversified in our unity. So this woman, you know, she tried to say, well, we worship over there. That's our type of church and you worship over there. No, li listen, guys. And, and because we worship over there is because what we've been told by our mums, our dads, our, 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 our past. You know, your mums and dads, you know, they may be right, but they could be wrong as well. You go back to the Bible and you find out what's right and you find out what's truth. That's why he says spirit and in truth. Find out objectively what is in spirit and what is in truth. It's very important for us to sometimes try to understand that. And we need to understand that as we move in to a greater arena with God and what God is doing. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I want to give you just another story because this is a very important issue here because of the tensions that we're going through in this season. Do you remember Peter in, in, the, in the book of Acts? Peter himself was a staunch Jew. He was a super Jew. I mean, he was the Jew, you know. And Peter, you know, was brought up as a staunch Jew. And so Peter himself, and we know in the, as we read in the book of Acts, Acts 10, we know that one day he has a vision. And he has a vision, you know, of a, of a white sheet and all these animals coming down. And he, he, he says, he looks at all this stuff. And then he's, he's been told to go to Cornelius' house to eat. And, and he, he looks at all these animals and he said, God, look, I don't eat these unclean things. He says, don't call these things unclean. What you call unclean, he says, I call clean. In, in other words, what he was saying is, is, the, is, the, is this. When I say it's good, you listen to me. You, you, don't, you don't go back to your culture, your Jewish culture. You listen to what I have to say. This is nothing to do with, with, whether you're white, brown, or black. This is to do with me. 
So he, sa he says, okay, now you go to Cornelius. And he went to Cornelius. Did you know what happened? And, and, and the household came to Christ. And, and we see a great picture of cross-culture. Now Peter now starts to eat. You know, he, he realizes that Gentiles actually cook. And they make food. And I don't know what was on that food table, but maybe there was pork there for the very first time. Maybe he ate pork for the very first time. Pigs for the very first time. I don't know. But he cross-cultured himself across because, Jesus, because God said, listen, whatever you call unclean, and some of us are calling things unclean, he says, I call clean. Be careful. Now, when we get to Galatians 2, you see, and, and you look at Galatians 2, and you, you'll find something in Galatians 2 that is quite upsetting as well. Peter then starts to sit down with a group of, of, of Jews, and, and he sits down, and, and he becomes hypocritical. We know this story very well. And then uh, uh, Gentiles then start to join him, and then he gets up. Now, he's the, he's the leader. He gets up because there are Gentiles there, and he starts to walk away, and a group of friends walk away, including his friend Barnabas. Now, now li listen to me, folks. This is hypocrisy. One minute, you're saying you're a Christian, and you say, love everybody, and we need to care for everybody. And then the next minute, you're walking away from the very people that you're supposed to be ministering to. And you know who, who, who condemns him, who admonishes him? He says, it's Paul that admonishes Peter. Peter, you're a hypocrite. And the man who's with him, now listen to this. This is ironic. Maybe you don't know it's in context. But the person who's with him was, is Barnabas. Remember Barnabas? Barnabas is the son of encouragement. So he encourages, 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 encourages. What does Barnabas do? He gets up with Peter and he walks with him. Now, you've got to remember, Barnabas was brought up in Cyprus, and Cyprus was full of Gentiles. In other words, Barnabas was brought up like a Gentile. And yet he gets up from his own people, and he walks. Because racism and cross-culturalism often takes a good man and makes him a bad man. It's sad. That's what it does. And the source is not the skin, it's the sin. It's never about the skin. It's always about the sin. And today, you know, we, we're, we're, we're seeing this. We, 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 we have to be neutral in terms of our Christianity, embrace our culture, and bring out the Christianity through our culture. Christ, we are a Christian, white, Christian, brown, Christian, black, Christian, Asian, Christian, whatever. We are Christians. We never walk away from the table. We always drink from the same cup that the Samaritan woman drinks from. And if we move away from those kind of things, you see, we're no better than those that are out there that are criticizing, condemning, and demolishing what God intended for love and care. So let me, let me, let, let me give you this. Embrace your, your, your culture. I, I thank the Lord. We are a multicultural church. We, we do not advocate racism. We do not advocate um, prejudice. We don't, uh, we don't advocate anything uh, that comes against what the Bible tells us to do. We're trying our best. We're not perfect, but we are trying our best. And you know how we do that here in City Life? Well, we intentionally do it. You know, by putting um, an Indian person... Uh, an African person, a Caribbean person, an English person, maybe mostly in every department group. So we make sure that there is intentional. And me as a leader, I intentionally cross-fertilize our cultures with each other. It's not always easy, but we tend to do it. But we don't do it for tokenism. We, you know, tokenism means that, oh yeah, let's just get somebody who's, who looks like that and put him in or put her in. You know, we don't do it for that. We do it because of their giftings. We do it because of their abilities. We do it because of their skills. We do it because of their personalities. We do it because of their character. We do it by everything but their skin color. And that's the way we work here. And that's the way I want to work here. And it's sad today that we are still talking about the same subjects that they talked about during Jesus' time and even before that, going right through to Cain and Abel. It's sad that we're still talking about those same subjects. 
But look, we got to stand as Christians and we got to find the peace. You know, the Prince of Peace is, is Christ. That's who he is. That's the peace. We have got to find the peace that will cross over. And if you're willing to cross over, and that's the key of being a Christian, is crossing over, knowing the cultures that are around you. You know, I love being, uh, being to almost 30 countries in my lifetime. I love all those countries that I've been to. Have they been challenging? Very challenging. Did, to, did I like it all the time? No, I didn't like it all the time. But I knew who I was in Christ when I went to those places. And, it's, it's, and, and they are wonderful places. They are marvelous places. I love the world. It's a great world that we live in. And the food is just incredible. We, as a church and I pray as this message goes out to the world, is let's embrace our brothers and sisters, no matter where they've come from, or who they've, or, who, or whatever they've done, you see. Let's embrace them, and let's take them and say to ourselves, you know, Lord, you put me on this earth as a Christian first, and then my identity of who I am to reach that culture I thank you for that, Lord. Father, I thank you that you've helped me to be within that culture, that I can embrace it and, and use it for the best of my ability. It's a tool. And I thank you for that tool that, that you've given me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Best in